the topic, I mean, the subject is one space at a time, and we have people who have been involved in spaces, but we will be addressing the larger issues in terms of what constitutes culture and what would be the contours of a future cultural uh, scenario in Bangalore. You know, I always keep maintaining that public, I mean, a city comes alive in its public spaces. And prima facie, the news in Bangalore has not been good. If you look at the 1995 CDP, the percentage of open spaces in that CDP was 25%. That time, the Bangalore's area was about 225 square kilometers. And the open spaces in the government CDP was 25%. In the latest CDP, which has been shelved, and they're going to redo it, it does have the data of the open spaces as they define it, which is really playgrounds and parks and stuff like that. That number is 4%. So our so-called master planning over the years has brought it from 25% open spaces to 4%. Somebody in BDS said, you're getting all the maths wrong. It's really around 10% open spaces, but it's still 25 to 10%. And that's the sad state of affairs that we have got, that we have got shrinking public spaces that's happening at one end. In the same environment, in terms of, uh, we have, in the last few years, seen new initiatives like IME, uh, MAP that's going to come up, the Church Street Redevelopment. Uh, um, I see Prem in the gather gathering who is working on the Science Gallery, Bangalore, the BIC. Suddenly, we have seen a sudden spurt in some of these institutions to add to historical cultural places that we have had, like typically Rangshankara, Jagriti, and there are quite a few spaces that have traditionally existed in this city. We're going to be discussing a whole host of issues, drawing on that experience. But I want to start initially with something that was in the news today. And Swamitra, that is something that you can help us unravel. So today, if you saw in the papers, there was mention about Freedom Park and the state of Freedom Park. Now, many years ago, and this was during the BATF stage, I, you, you know, you won this competition, and you and Nisha worked on that Freedom Park. We saw some of the pictures. 15, 17 years later, how do you see what you had as a vision for what Freedom Park could be versus how it has played out over the last so many years? So, um when um, this this i think freedom park has been the longest project for us there are parts which were which which have still not been achieved uh, which is not about building but i think we realized while we were working on it that uh, there has to be a mechanism to create um, events and also to make it a place where people would come again and again, not just people from the neighborhood, but also from the larger parts of city and of course the state and outside. And we tried to form a trust um, and um, Arundhati was part of it. Uh, at that time, <coughs> Girish Karnat was there. So we had meetings, but nothing came through because we knew this was going to be a challenge. And uh, because in my um, experience, it is not about the creation of the infrastructure right. at all. Actually, it's what you do, what happens there. And I think that's the key factor where government seems to be on a weak footing. They actually do not have um, any kind of mechanism uh, or even an imagination. So it's really an issue of stewardship. So we had a nice uh, place developed. And I mean, it was a great place, uh, Freedom Park. But essentially, it fell through in terms of how it is used on a day-to-day -day basis. And given that government was sitting in the middle of it all, there's clearly no imagination in how the space can be used. One last show of hands. How many of you have been to Freedom Park? Now, this is going to be a snapshot because this is a list of activists in the city. Because if you know, Freedom Park is typically the place where all activists land up. So big brothers watching in terms of people who have been out there. <laughs> I just want to quickly move to another thing that you were part of, Sumitra. I don't, I'm not implying that somehow some of the projects you do look nice but end up not being used properly. The War Memorial is another example where influential people got a place developed in a particular manner. It has its own plus points. But I mean, the place is a disaster in terms of its use, except from some, maybe some morning and evening walkers. So how would you read what happened at the war memorial 
building on from what happened at Freedom Park in terms of how a place which was built in an interesting manner, but subsequently in use, doesn't work too well. So um, the memorial, of course, it has a much more somber purpose, and um, and at um, at that location, of course, the idea was to first and foremost give you know uh, the respect to the martyrs and. Uh, also make the building underground so that the most of the green could continue. Now, <clears throat> although this doesn't qualify as a, uh, for me, as a public uh, public place in the sense that uh, most of our places are fenced off. and uh, But our gardens in neighborhoods are also fenced off. Yes, so th there is an issue with that. So I... So here I would like to see it as an outsider, even though I may have been part of the project, uh, uh, that most of these places, and this is a larger question I think which we can explore, that uh, this, of course, it has certain symbolic value. And there is a kind of a desire for uh, creation of a place which is related to the history, whether it's uh, because in this case it is more national history and that's also related to the politics of state and ev everything else. So uh, what does a place become? Um, what is the current, uh, what is a real public place in, can it, uh, what can it be in, a, uh, in the present condition? Does it have to be um, a landmark because first of all I mean I take the position that the city um, architecture does not have to be iconic necessarily unless it it is uh, it is important for it to grab eyeballs for purposes of getting noticed and there are places where it has to um, <clears throat> almost um, dilute itself to exist um, and just merge into the city. But it will still be a place where public can congregate. Would that be a basic definition of what yes, this place should serve? Yes, yes. Okay. That that would be the thing. So what we are talking about is actually the generic. Uh, is there a new need for generic spaces which can be appropriated and absorbed for different things and by different people, uh, which perhaps is more democratic than otherwise? So another issue, because staying with the public, you appropriated. I mean, you're one of the only persons in this room who actually stole a street. So tell us about Church Street and how you would assess what you had in mind while doing Church Street and what it is today. How would you rate it? Okay. So the first mail that you uh, sent to us asked this question. How do architects negotiate these boundaries between the ethos of new spaces and the sensibilities of an existing cityscape. The question should actually be the other way around. How do you negotiate these boundaries between the sensibilities of new spaces and the ethos of the existing? You got it. That was upside it. Down. Was not my wording. I'm Syntax. looking at the person who did so, the wording. No, <laughs> it's important because I feel that, partly agreeing with what Swamitra has said. Public projects should fill a need. It should not be because of someone's ego or particularly the architect's ego. That's the last in the priority list. But many of these public spaces that you see, like for instance, the military memorial, is an interested group who wants to create it for a singular purpose. And those are not public spaces. They are so-called public spaces. I would rate, say, what uh, Pavitra's firm has done, Brigade Gateway, as the biggest private public space in Bangalore because it is the only ungated community in the whole city. Everybody else wants to sit in gated communities, but the public spaces of the project like Brigade Gateway is actually open to all and it's super inclusive. Anybody can go in. There's no pressure on you to buy anything, enjoy the water, enjoy the fountain, run around the plaza, do whatever you want. And it's actually a curiously the most successful public private space public space in Bangalore, which is actually a private space. So it's the other way around. So initially, when I tried to convince the government to invest in public, public spaces, nobody was listening to us, right? They're saying, no, 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 it can't be done, and it's too complicated, and 
is not possible and etc etc so i started taking government and showing them this project saying that why if i can pull it off in the private realm what stops why can't you do it and that was one of the triggers for it and then suddenly when the government suddenly decided post our uh, great steel flyover uh, debacle that happened that i had to do some kind of return gift i said okay i'll do this for free pro bono publico for the public point group. please note naresh does do pro bono work yeah pro bono it's fully pro bono actually i spent money on it that's the funny part so and there was simply no data there was some very basic uh, sketch of it so i actually got it surveyed i put a first time used a drone which has now become very common 5 years back nobody had heard of drone surveys and all that and then we found out that you remember that we also spoke about what's underground nobody had any idea so we assumed it would be logical and proposed a scheme to the government for some budget assuming that all we have to do is to put nice drains and some nice quality surface and it was it got approved and they said do it and they were all quite surprised why i didn't want to get paid for it but i said that's probably l0 because in in government all government infrastructure contracts are given to what is called the l1 tender which is the lowest usually lowest in brains also that contractor not just in budget they will have no idea how to do it so i said let me do l0 which means you have to give it to me because i don't want any money i am the lowest of them all so it worked quite well and part of my company csr was diverted into so what are the key objectives you shot for while uh, yeah so the thing was initially the idea was to make it a fully pedestrianized street but then we quickly realized there are 40 families and 10 offices on the street other than the retail which needed their cars to be parked inside and you couldn't so we changed the wording to a pedestrian oriented street where we narrowed the carriage way to whatever it was our tender show of principle narrowest all the way through and made sure there was a 2 meter footpath minimum on both sides and it becomes wider and wider the, the street is a funny street it's 60 feet wide at the koshis and is 30 feet wide at brigade road it's like a trumpet right like that like it's a gradual trumpet the when we dug the street right we found that there is one patal lok below which It's is kind of a mohenjo daro excavation yeah, mohenjo daro there were about 36 high tension electric cables some pictures were shown on the screen a little while ago and probably i'll come back to how it was it was a complex procedure involving bbmp bascom water board traffic police you name it and each of these agencies in bangalore i discovered to my horror operate with their own data silo everybody has a different idea of the street and to add insult to injury the entire because politicians go on mg road all the electrical infrastructure of mg road was put on church street as a service street right and it was completely blocked so there's a whole lot of complexity to Correct. pulling off the project right but if you look at it in terms of what has it done for the city post that i'm trying to understand what it has created in a sense of community well, from a in the instagram spaces. point of view it is the number one photograph street in india <laughs> and two it is the most popular fashion destination of bangalore city outdoor shoots you look you look at it there is a new series by van heusen at leisure if you google it if you want it looks like it's been shot in some european capital and it's all shot I and mean, i'm not saying it i necessarily want to create any european sensibility but more it looks like somebody told me that it looks foreign so it doesn't look and it, people love seem to love it the weekends in which we along with belt managed to shut it for weekends of phenomenal crowds i wish they had continued the initiative it was the case when they had that mg road open streets Correct. one particular yeah, day this happened for over 6 almost 4 months so right. it was a very uh, pleasant thing to see and the pollution on the street came down to below international levels so i think these kind of things are required more i don't know why so so nadesh i mean you mentioned instagram and fashion so one of the complaints that come really is it's not inclusive enough where are the uh, hawkers where are they integrated so the yeah. question i have is when you design these things uh, do you take them clearly yeah, into account right. just talk us through that because this inclusive city yeah, right. is an important point to yeah, right. so, so the, i mean i don't have to uh, it's not a matter of choice two things when you say inclusive there are two issues right one is a community inclusion and second is people with disabilities and special needs 
right so the, the street is 100% disabled friendly and with special needs also people with partial vision it's got color, tactile tactile sensors ta plus tactile plus color it uses every single it's actually got a certificate from some the an organization saying that it's a most disabled everything is perfectly done there i personally saw to it also from a community inclusion point there is a supreme court directive that when you say hawker zones one week after it opened right and the crowd started surging to see what is this new magic in town right there was 40 i counted one evening there were 47 pani puri vendors on that one road with little drums selling pani puri so there is something called too many hawkers also so there is so, you know there is at some point it cannot go that they block the footpath and you can't walk there you can't have that so the supreme court has said designated area so wherever the footpath is wider than 2.5 meters the bbmp is supposed to have said here 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 and here which i but they when they were do, initially they did it and afterwards i don't know whether it was carried through and it's not very difficult to do and it's easily doable there and when you have the pedestrianized street the whole thing became like a flea market on both sides of the road so it's completely possible thanks so naresh i mean i think we have a grateful city for what you have done on church street right guys hope so uh pavitra coming to you i mean naresh brought you into the conversation uh you see i started with the public to get a sense of you know the places where actually the government is expected to do a lot of things but it has its own problems in doing them and particularly definitely has lots of problems in running and i will come back to ngma later this another uh, example i want to bring there are challenges in terms of managing it etc and therefore there's a certain amount of government failure in providing these kind of public spaces and cultural spaces even historically ravindra kalakshetra was reasonably iconic at a point of time now see where it is at currently in the earlier days the maharajas and maharanis were the ones who were patronizing the arts culture and these kind of institutional activity and my case always has been that in the new era it's business the you know the unicorns and these all these high net worth individuals who are the new maharajas and maharanis so as part of this uh, maharani pavitra what prompted you to think in terms of doing an indian music experience because it's off the normal track i mean you are one of the first in a large uh, project you chose to earmark space and as he said it's a really a public public space anybody is welcome can go there sit there all that stuff so what was the thinking that you should do this because in a sense you broke the mold with what you have done yeah uh, first of all thank you for having me here and i am being a part of this uh, fantastic event um i'll have to say that i'll have to bump up the uh the yes <laughs> yes the, the maharani status to my father who is the maharaja who created it honestly i don't think it came from that kind of angle at all but um uh, being the chairman of brigade and being already in the development space uh, he was visiting seattle and at that time there was a museum that was entirely devoted to jimi hendrix and and he had visited it and he thought there's a museum for just one man's music in this country in the us and we don't have anything in india that memorializes the rich culture and heritage especially music uh, of our country um at all anywhere in the country so i mean he's not a musician by nature or training or anything but he loves it he's he loves listening to music of all types of all types of genres and he thought why not do something uh, like that and uh, one of his beliefs is in general being able to create public spaces in whatever manner he can uh, and ime is one such example so um, that was that was purely sort of the motive behind it how do we create some kind of a uh, place that will house all types of indian music not just traditional where it is carnatic or hindustani but something that documents all kinds of music bollywood contemporary bands like cryptos you know street uh, uh, music festivals anything which is part of our cultural fabric um and that's what the uh, what that's what is under the roof of the ime and that's what will continue to be uh, what ime documents so one is just getting everything together in a place 
Two is documenting all of that uh, culture and heritage for the purpose of making the youth of this country proud of what we have. Um, everyone talks about westernization and so on, and I've done the same. I grew up seeing Carnatic, and then as soon as I could stop doing the lessons, I stopped and you know tried to learn Western music instead. I also saw photographs on the net about the Huzu of India visiting IME. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, it's about how do we actually create pride in in the generations of the future about what we have and draw on that. Um, so a lot of what the IME's purpose is, is to bring youth into it and educate the youth about uh, Indian music, all aspects of Indian music. And what we've all been talking about is make the place um, important in the community. Uh, so bring people together for, uh, you know, music, musical events, uh, for dialogue about music. Um, one of the things IME would love to do is actually, um, you know, um, archive a lot of the music that we have, which is a whole separate uh, initiative. And finally, can you use music as uh, a way to do community outreach? So those are the goals kind of behind I IME and a lot of the reason for why the programming is the way it is. And how would you assess the last four years, COVID included? Yeah. Uh, how has it played out in your view? So, I mean, it took a long time to just build a museum. It's been a 10-year project in the making, uh, raising a lot of funds, of course, supported uh, on the construction side, design, all of that by Brigade, but also many well-wishers. We've had support from the Ministry of Culture and Government of India, uh, which is also a great way to actually show that if you're able to you know, uh, position it the right way, you can get support from the government, at least in terms of setup. And like you said, maintenance and so on, it makes sense that a private enterprise or a trust or something is doing it so that right. it's taken care of. Um, uh, yeah, so sorry, you were... No, that's what I just want... Sorry, uh, oh, the last four years. Four years yeah. yeah, so of course, we opened right before covid struck, right? We were in a soft opening uh, phase for the most of 2019. And we were gearing up to open the museum. And of course, the lockdown happened. So in some ways, um, we made the best of it. I think moving to a virtual environment just kind of helped getting visibility of IME out there on a global kind of stage, doing a lot of events. Uh, we collaborated with you uh, at BIC as well. Um, so slowly, we've seen a lot of the events uh, get um, you know, more physical visitors. Um, and we've seen that actually really pick up over the last few months. So we're, and of course, uh, things have gone viral on social media. So it's been difficult keeping the museum running, but we can see that there is a lot of engagement uh, across the board. Uh, it's a great place for young people to come, older generations also to visit. The IME also has a learning center. So that's one of the supporting ways in which the, um, in which music education can also work. Uh, Any plans for a North Bangalore campus, IME? And a, because Bangalore's got so much sprawl, and yeah. this is in one corner of Bangalore. Is that yeah. a limitation in any sense for spaces like this? Yes, I think so. I mean, land for these kind of uses is not easy to come by. Um, that's probably the one thing that in, in the entire scheme of IME, I think that's the one thing that maybe could have helped it. In the, enti in, in the design ethos, I'm, I'm the only non-architect here, no, but... No, please, um, please. Oh, you just... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, but when I was talking to our team about it, the, you know, the whole design angle was um, well thought through, uh, but the only difference was that the land, uh, we, it is in JP Nagar, and the way our city has grown has just become very provincial. So, you know, um, Somitra and I were talking and, and I said I was coming from Malaysia and he's like, that's quite a hike. And I was saying, hardly any of my friends from Indira Nagar have even gone to Brigade Gateway or seen it because they're like, that's too far away. Mm -hmm. So um, when people think, okay, I've got to go to JP Nagar to see this museum, that's usually the thing that's holding them back. But uh, hopefully that's going to change. Uh, I think um, the fact that we have a world-class music museum in Bangalore, the only of its kind in the city and the country, hopefully will give it the due that it deserves. Yeah, no, build it and they'll come. Hopefully. So right now, no plans to do something in another location, but maybe try to harness more in the virtual environment. Right. I'd like to ask the two architects, uh, you know, when you get briefs and, you know, you work on these projects public, this whole thing about function and form, etc. How do you do these trade-offs in terms of, uh, to, I mean, which gets primacy and do you visualize enough in terms of what do end users really need and you factor all that in while planning or is it something that 
you know that this is the kind of thing I brush strokes I want to make and do. So I want to get a sense when you design these kind of cultural spaces, there are stakeholders, multi stakeholders, you use it. And uh, even if you take the arts and culture, the kind of needs that, you know, I don't know how many people even take care of the needs of the producers, the people who do the recording studios or the people who have the dance uh, places. So I just want to get a sense from an architect perspective that how do you approach this space design in this, if I can call it as a function form trade-off? Well, <laughs> yeah, I think the first thing which, uh, first thing which we as architects do, and we, I mean Nisha and <laughs> me, is how to subvert it. And, um, try to embed things which um, because I think unless there is a personal stake in um, and um, an agenda which takes it beyond what is being asked so that that I think becomes the first step and how to um, kind of plant these little seeds of what uh, could make a larger difference which uh, either is not being asked or it's not being mentioned, although it's there in the mind of the client or whoever it is. So that, I think that is a very, uh, it's a phase of a lot of struggle because you are constant, it's a, uh, these kind of projects are completely negotiated projects. They are not, um, and I'm glad that it is so because I think it's, it's, a, it's trying to deal with a challenge and it's bringing more value because People are coming from different perspectives, whether, whether it's the client or the trust and the architect, you know, trying to negotiate something. <clears throat> of course, we do, do feel bad that certain things do not happen the way, because we are clear about the purpose of the project and yet the better solutions are not being uh, accepted. So that's where I feel that somewhere we are helpless. And I think that's one of the problems. So in some sense, you're, in a sense, unhappy at the end of every problem. <coughs> no, it's not the done. unhappiness. If we, architect is the most vulnerable creature in the whole exercise. They're not in control, actually. Although they're seemingly the authors, but they're actually not in control. So, um, so I think this struggle is, is, is a very interesting phase. Um, when you spoke about uh, how does one decide what kind of direction it should take. Um, Since MAP is a <coughs> work in progress, maybe you yeah. could walk us through some choices that had to be made there and is in the process of being made. Yes. Uh, so As I long as it's not a secret. <laughs> so I think on one, uh, one thing I need to just, uh, you mentioned about the functional aspects and those are not negotiable. Uh, anything to do with the purpose of a place is it's not paramount. It's paramount. It's absolute paramount and there is no compromise unless there is some serious difficulty in achieving that. Uh, but is there enough thinking about the possible functions, the multifunctions that are required? Is there enough thinking at the outset? It happens. It is not. It happens. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> now one can take divergent views. One can say that the city uh, or architecture uh, whether it should be iconic to attract attention because uh, let's say in the case of map and i think the most uh, the best essays i've re read is the Since conversation. a lot of people don't know where map is going to come up <coughs> I think you should just mention so that. this is opposite the vishweshwara uh, science museum on kasturba road its property adjoins uh, at its rear the british library so it's on the kasturba road facing that <clears throat> so the uh, the most in interesting conversation about museums ha happens between Hal Foster and um, uh, Rem Kulas. And uh, if one goes through that, it's a tiny book, very, very interesting. Um, and you, you realize that uh, architecture is actually fluctuating between uh, where you need to grab attention and where you have to let go. And here, in, especially in this case, and that's my personal position um, for art space, that because of the uncertainty of what art can do and what, um, what endless possibilities it might have, that the building has to become as generic 
and invisible uh, and almost of no character okay. on the inside. But on the exterior, it needs to present itself to the world stage, say that I have arrived, I have to attract that attention and for that, uh, <clears throat> it becomes, I'm imagining that it will be given the name of it looks like a water tank, as you'll, which you'll soon realize that the people will call it the Tanki building, <laughs> you know, which I'm very happy with because I think then there is a clear. Connection. As long as the BWSSB doesn't come and take ownership, <clears throat> you're okay. Yeah, I I don't mind large taps they put like uh, Oldenburg on the fence. So inside, really, it can be whatever you want it to be. I think that's the malleability, flexibility that the place needs to lend itself, while the outside has a certain appeal and attraction value. I think that's the sense. Naresh, your take? You can't really reduce a building or a project to a binary like form follows function or function okay. follows form or actually the only thing form follows really, form and function actually follow is strategy, how to do it. And I deal with a, I don't really deal with individuals very much in these days. I deal mostly with institutions and city agencies and so on. So really speaking, you have to understand uh, what are uh, in management jargon pro properly called stakeholders, except that in public projects, every stakeholder has actually got a stake in his hand with a pointy <laughs> part pointing, with a pointy part pointing towards you, right? Like, so usually the architect becomes the lightning rod of that uh, exercise, right? They're all coming at you like that. So. So the thing is, you have to, like he mentioned, we actually used the exact same philosophy what Swamitra is saying when we did NGMA many years ago and said that the building must have grace and character but must not obtrude on the sensibility so that as to not, sometimes a, muse a museum can outshine the art itself presented inside. Frank Gehry's buildings are a classic example of that. You go to see the building, not the art. That's the whole issue with the buildings like that. But in NGMS case, they are slightly different. The brief given to me was to knock down mud building and build a new art gallery, which was that it is the single largest bungalow ever built in Bangalore. It's about 20,000 square feet on just two levels, right? So it's a huge building. And but a quick question there. Why does NGMA have a colonial attitude where we, I mean, I was just talking to Pavitra and she tries to go there at 6 or 7 in the morning. They don't let it's you in. It's run by a government of India. <laughs> now, the day, anyway, we'll come to, they'll explain that now off, offline. Offline. There's a reason for it. <laughs> but there, what we decided to do was keep the whole building, if you want a simple analogy, something like a diamond set in a ring of modern buildings. The old building would be the, and you also put a reflecting pool to make sure that you don't miss the point, that it's a really... A lovely old building and it needs to be seen in two directions at the same time. You double it with using a reflecting pole. And the galleries, if you notice, you actually never notice them. Have you noticed? When you go to see an art thing, you only notice the big building and the rest of it, you flow through it, it and the rest of it is 70,000 square feet. It's three times as big as but the... But the scale is not noticeable you when you see look it. at it. So that's one of the things that you do and only the open spaces between the old building and new building are again designed as public spaces where you feel like hanging out. Those courtyards yes. and... You but we are not allowed most of the time. Yeah, that's another... Like he pointed out, there are two issues when you create a public space. One is getting it done right. One is making sure all the stakeholders put the stake back in the ground and push off after giving their input, to getting it done to the quality you want. And three, the real issue with Freedom Park, for instance, is lack of a maintenance strategy. So the same problem has come in all the tender sure roads, all the five-year maintenance contracts are over. Already you can see the roads falling apart. I've been telling the government, renew the contracts. Church Street, every now and then some interesting reporter will say two stones have come out and it will become national news. Every road gets potholes, right? Most of us uh, lay a road, tomorrow morning you'll have a BWSSP would have cut it. But these streets are special. People own it. They don't like the slightest bit of damage to a public space. So what we are doing now as a future forward strategy, 
and all of you can look forward to this. I hope I'm not speaking too soon. So, literally to put the head into the lion's mouth, because of this Church Street success, we said let's do a 11 kilometer long stretch. And that too inside a sewage stormwater drain. I don't know, I think it's called biting off more than you can chew, but simple problems tend to bore me. These complex things where multiple ages... This, this is a more, project that's called Korea Mangala. Yeah, because Korea, the inspiration is the no, no, it's a Korean... All of you, you will see it coming. You can see the beginnings of it already as you see in the city. It is called the K-100 Citizens Waterway. You can literally walk from Hazrat Mosque on SJP Road near City Market all the way to Belandur. It's like a... And through the... What is the literally the armpit of the city, the backyard of the city? Because that is where the poorest people live. When you're talking about inclusivity, that is where the people who serve the people who live in the well-off parts of the Libya, that's where they all live, right next to a stinking stormwater drain. 130 million liters a day of water was flowing through that raw sewage into Belandur Lake every day, one year ago. Today, it's come down to 3 million liters. 98% is gone. And we're also putting a walkway inside. So there the point I wanted to make was, all of you can see the beginning of it. There's an entry gateway park right opposite the bus stand on Double Road. It cuts Double Road at one point. Right opposite the BMTC terminal, there's a brand new one-acre park done beautifully. It's already open to the public. You can go and use it. Right now, if you don't mind a little bit of smell from the 3 million liters which is still flowing. Whatever I do, I'm not able to stop it. I hope we can do that. But there what we have done is, we have built what is called a new kind of contract into the government system. When we know this maintenance issue will be an issue. So what we have done there is build something called a design build operate transfer model where the contractor who builds it has to look after it for 5 years. After 5 years, similar to the tender show model. But in this case, he's also responsible for the design. It's not like I've given you a pumping mechanism and it, if it fails, you can't blame the architect. The, my job is to only come up with a concept and how to do it. And beyond that, the contractor has to own responsibility. So as a cultural for, space, what is your imagination of that space in Shantinagar? What do you see happening it will, there? It will it's be, just a community no, gathering no, no. space. Along the drain, there are five such parks being created in Bangalore, the whole thing will become an ecological corridor and it will become the celebration of one World Earth Day that will imagine, instead of imagining a stormwater drain as a stormwater drain, right now it's a sewage drain, right? Yeah. Why stop there? Why can't you imagine it as an economic, like a non-motorized transport alternative mobility plan for the city through a perfectly green corridor in which you see the Bangalore is the largest city in the world. By, for, when, by when, Naresh? No, no, hold on. I want to make one last point before I tell you. It was supposed to be, a lot of it was supposed to be done by today. But it's going to take another year at least. But what will happen is that Bangalore is the largest city in the world, not next to a natural feature. No river, no lake, all lakes are man-made. No, and we have one tiny rivulet called the Vrishabhavati, which is again a even more bigger sewage drain. No mountain, no sea. So, in some sense, by doing, by if we, there are 852 kilometers of stormwater drains in Bangalore, 400 are Raja Kaluas, 400 kilometers. If you're able to pull up a project like this, we will get a 400 kilometer long waterfront. And this has been done successfully in Bangkok, it's been done in Seoul, Europe of course, no need to say only, but even in our latitude, countries in our latitude, it's been in Singapore, everywhere it's there. It, and it need not be the most beautiful space in the city, it has to be a stormwater drain which works as a stormwater drain when it rains. 62 days a year, day, year it rains in Bangalore. 300, and, 300 days it will become an underground alternative mobility network for the city. People can go for walks, it's, you go and play there in the parks. It will just become a... And it also in one area, there is a one, two acres of land, which we are converting it into a public, like a, what do you call it, like a public uh, performance, community performance space and uh, all that is also coming uh, sooner or later. So hopefully, 
the success of the project you can see already every last year it rained a lot right it rained 83 days and it rained 1200 mm last year normal is 900 not once did double road flood not once did egipura flood nothing happened because there's no more sewage in the drain and when the rain came there was place for it to flow peacefully into belandur lake and the funniest end product of all this is belandur lake hasn't caught fire for the last one year because the no more sewage is going there it's going to a sewage treatment plant and last but not the least somebody sent me a photograph recently birds migratory birds are nesting on belandur lake again so from a real estate perspective please buy property along the drain or maybe around <laughs> belandur lake it will so, go up like crazy that, that sounds like a game changing thing and since he mentioned birds a shout out for the indian music experience has a bird song uh, underway right now as we speak So when you get a, you want to quickly speak yeah. about the bird song yeah, thing yeah 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 it's a, it's an ex, it's a new exhibit at IME and it's a it's called bird song and it's about the music of birds and then there's there's a conservation element to it so i think it's spanning a lot of very different things and uh, again there are interactive elements that i may have missed mentioning that but one of the usps of ime is that many of the exhibits are interactive and using uh, technology uh, this one has a cool exhibit where you can mix different songs of birds together and create your own sort of bird song uh, so it's it's fun for kids fun for adults and you also learn a bit about about conservation good so that's the advertising break now coming <laughs> back uh you see we think of these things as physical spaces i want to understand what we can do in terms of a future cultural outlook for the city which is in the open spaces i mean it's already happening i mean you take the karaga festival or you take the even the you know kadlakai parishay kind of sessions and where community gathers there's a lot of the future of bangalore lies in thinking imaginatively of what i would call as non physical spaces but things coming alive in the commons in a sense so what would that imagination look like if we had to see in terms of the things that we can do in the open i don't think we lack for a dearth of traditions in the city right the karaga is some 500 year old there's enough of that there's only no place to do it the real issue is that i think if you if you create these things see it's also not just important to continue old traditions but in my opinion it's time to create some new traditions also by drawing on the past for instance every time i have been trying to tell the government on kempe gowda's birthday we don't know how they found out but they fixed it for <laughs> june 28th or something like that is the right and the anecdotal story that you all know about our founder of our city is that he harnessed four bullocks to a uh, plow and made them walk in four directions where they stopped was the boundary of the old pete right that's what he said why not reenact that scene on that day with a maybe with four bullocks and maybe with celebrities in each uh, yeah. cart that's pulled along make a parade out of it make a procession out of it make a festival out of it right. we were almost going to do it in 2019 so our version of a carnival of why not no you need to bring this see you in bangalore the imagination of our authorities thinks that everything is a road the word street is alien to them a street by definition is a shared space with vehicles and people and commerce and inclusion and everything and if you create things like this well, emphasis on some signal free corridors yeah every time the focus is on how to move vehicles faster that's a, i'm saying it's a very engineering mindset if you will excuse me it's, a, it's an engineering thing but what architects play is bring people into infrastructure the like for instance the best compliment on church street i've ever received first from the paura karmika which is not even intended as a compliment because i made friends with everybody on the street because i knew after building this if you don't make the people who look after the street invested in looking after it will fall apart so i went and actually spent time so they became friends with three women control that street every day okay at 10 o'clock in the morning they're sitting on that opposite that empire hotel on the footpath and chewing pan so i said we enama kelsa illwa kelsa la agoyta ashbega and she says lasar yaro kasane akalla illi so 
imagine a statement like that. So, what the point I'm trying to make is that we are not proud. We, are, we have to develop a sense of pride in our commons. We think the commons, the outside, is somebody else's problem. Typically, the government. The government actually has the exact opposite view. They think it's your problem because <laughs> so they think that why are youth like for instance in the K hundred drain we find mattresses, sofa sets. <laughs> no, I mean I'm, it's an archaeological dig of incredible uh, <laughs> proportion. And the government says no, it's our general. What can we do? So at some point we have to uh, figure out that who's responsible, right? But if a power karmika has less work. Because of what I do, I think the, it's a successful project. Right? If yes, without chilling without. Out. Yeah, and also in civic pride, I think indoor for the, those who yeah. might have gone there recently. You try throwing trash anywhere. You just try throwing trash. The sense of pride in the city, the reason it has come as the best city on cleanliness for five consecutive years is because of that civic pride which each uh, individual... You might argue that it's an elite thing, etc, etc. Right? But really, on Church Street, you see all kinds of people. Yes. And nobody throws trash. There are trash bins everywhere, of course. But nobody throws trash. So similarly, if we can bring... The point I am trying is, if you bring the people into in public infrastructure, if you say, consider every metro station in Bangalore as a cultural hub, rather than a vacuum to suck people off the ground, put them in a train and spit them out somewhere else. <laughs> right? And, and, that, and allow busking and all that. Every, every, allow busking. every two kilometers, there's a metro station. I've told the metro people, <laughs> give it to me, I'll imagine it as a cultural hub for that community. That entire community of two kilometer radius around the station should run it like a programs for children, programs for youth, music in the evenings. Why is it being treated as a piece of... If you bring people the quality of the space and the maintainability of the space and the usability of the space, it will morph in ways you can never predict. And that's the beauty of a new city, right? It's a so, so that's that's a good... You want to say I something? I wanted to good? add something. Um, something that you said about Church Street. So um, I moved back to Bangalore about six years ago. And when I did that, I met a citizen movement here um, called Ugly Indian. Ugly Indian. And the insights from that group were phenomenal. And I think, uh, number one, what uh, first of all, we're so lucky we have these guys in, in Bangalore. They're lucky and in the audience. No, 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 but, uh, we shall not, we shall not. I don't not. know, I've never seen them. We don't them. out the ugly Indians. I don't, I've never seen them, so. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, that was one of the biggest learnings. I don't know how many of you know kind of the background, but some of the learnings were you make a clean street, people will not want to throw garbage. Why were we throwing garbage? Because there were no trash cans, there were no garbage cans. Um, you know, all you and and the one of the uh, big takeaways that even I had is what we just talked about is that maintenance is essential. People are willing to put in capex to do whatever, build toilets, build streets, whatever. But if you don't maintain it, then it's just going to end up, you know, um, decaying and degrading. So um, I think that's one reason why private enterprise is also important because there is the willingness and foresight to to see through your investment. Right. And not let it go to waste. Go to see. And uh, having citizens involved is again that sense of ownership at large. Right. So these are concepts that I think it's great to see it play out. Um, you know, programs like with the Ugly Indian are actually very corporate friendly and very, you know, uh, inexpensive ways to actually make huge differences across the city. Sure. You want to say something? Yeah. yeah. No, I think before uh, Naresh puts all the people out of their jobs by making better <laughs> streets. Um, no jokes apart, I think uh, two two things, I think you did come, uh, you know, talk about the uh, metro station and the possibilities of such places. The <clears throat> That obviously is an unexplored territory, which, um, because I infrastructure has so far been so delinked from the idea of design and its possibilities for society. So that's uh, one thing. My... Um, the one point which I wanted to raise was, uh, why do we imagine always um, a public space as to that is related to a creation of uh, a, building? a building? Why is it not that we can, uh, that we reclaim voids in the city? Why cannot I buy a void? Instead of building the building, I'll spend that much money to create the void. Um, if, if it's missing, that I work on the void. 
and i think it has been that the pattern of development has uh, largely neglected in terms in terms of uh, one is about the patterns of development whether you look at the neighborhood park which is primarily fenced with green and a pathway and locked most of the time and not really open at times when you really want to uh, use it and um, second is that uh, it is not creating um, new patterns which can actually uh, be far better utilized be safer um, and richer in experience uh, at all times so uh, because it has largely come from a numbers driven kind of pattern that there's a designation of green space and uh, a percentage but the qualitative aspect is largely not recognized so uh, it's about the idea of claiming because in the absence of a strategy that means is there a place for um you know uh, capturing certain places got it that that if we can look at that can be quite okay. phenomenal in fact you know you are talking about the bullock cart and recreating that i am told that the maharaja used to go from the bangalore palace to the mysore palace to the which is the nr road i think is the longest road in the city and then go on to kanakpura road that was the traditional route of going and there's a possibility of a recreation of what that meant at that point of time yes. which brings me to one, two points i quickly want to cover is this whole issue of heritage and culture you know this uh, uh we are one of the cities that really doesn't have a very clear cut heritage act some of the other cities are a lot more progressive and naresh you also worked on how you could there are 50 60 buildings between city market and bangalore palace that could be reimagined and done something so what do we need to do to get a certain sense of appreciation for this heritage protection of heritage encouraging these kind of things so that we don't lose them and we don't lose the memory of the kind of things that we had what is it that we can do because we seem to be I mean, we now lost the new empire theater a week ago and we understand that it's a private space and it's a private owners thing but how do we get to saying that some of these things need preservation and we need to do what it takes and it's as important a part of bangalore's cultural future first probably you need a mayor or a or at least an executive mayor in bangalore who is born in bangalore this city is always ruled and administered at a political level from politicians outside of bangalore who 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 come who see it as a site of uh, their career and not as a site of habitation for all of us they don't they're not invested in it at a physical level like people who are born here or lived here most of their life do that is a big ask that's not really easy to pull off but in the interim i would think that bangalore is now i just saw the statistic before walking in today there are 32 unicorns in bangalore each worth more than a billion dollars the embedded companies of bangalore are at least worth if not 10 times that as more and the amount of csr money that should be available in a city like this must be in the order of 15 20000 crores a year right i'm not saying all of it has to come here but really speaking a concerted push appealing to bangaloreans to reclaim their city's pride by the movers and shakers of this city who also put their money where their mouth is like for instance if you look at the national uh, trust in england they had the same problem after the world war right. after where a lot of the traditional buildings are being knocked off and to be replaced by ugly modern buildings in the what i think prince charles called barnacles on the face of london some of them are truly barnacles also so what they did was they did a clever thing we are actually i don't know whether you remember we had suggested it to the then chief minister when we still had something called the karnataka state lottery that all the profits from the lot the british pools all the profits from the british pools go to national heritage so it, you allow a certain if you want to call it vice to exist in society but the proceeds from the vice go for a great cause the national heritage buys every single property that comes on sale at market price in the in the whole of england right and also 
takes over all public buildings which are outlived their use for what it was built for. Like, for instance, the many of the buildings on Palace Road in Bangalore. The meteorological department, why do they need to sit in a 150-year-old building is beyond me. Or the core of detectives or whatever it is. They're all sitting on that road, right? But if we can come together... So you want to repurpose some of those places? Adaptive reuse. Adaptive is the reuse. architectural jargon we use. Without destroying the ethos and the character of that, reimagine it. No, it's not that why should it be continued to be used for what... NGMA was somebody's house. Now you can't tell that it's become a... It looks like it was always built like for a... Right. It can, but the outside of it is unchanged. Not even a drop of it. And... That creates continuity in a city. Most people in Bangalore who have come to Bangalore in the last 10-15 years think Bangalore started roughly the same time as Infosys. <laughs> around 1990 or something like that. So, people don't realize that it's 485 years old and in 2037, we'll be, we're older than Bombay, we're older than Chennai and we're older than Calcutta. Only Delhi and Jaipur and Varanasi of course is older than Everybody else and twice as old as that put together again. But Bangalore is not a young city. Got it. And if we do not have a sense of pride in continuity, a pride in our children knowing, and our children's children now, probably my generation, knowing what made the city who it was, we will lose it all. We, and it's possible to do it. A lot, of, a lot of groups in the city are trying to do it. But really one great corporate sponsor with a big bequest or somehow convince the government to divert say five paisa out of every liter of petrol or one, ru <laughs> one rupee out of every bottle of booze sold in the city, we can save it all. Got it. Thanks. Uh, before throwing it open, a last question to the panelists and we could start with you. Uh, you know, we have had monikers like Garden City, now currently the Startup City, maybe like I said, we have the most unicorn, maybe Unicorn City. So there's no science city historically, in a sense. What would it take for Bangalore, in your view? I mean, your imagination of if Bangalore is to be called the cultural city in the country, what would its contours look like? I mean, he gave, for example, Naresh did speak about, you know, people singing in the metro or stuff like that. So what are the kind of elements that you foresee that happening such that more of our public spaces come alive, both by government and private? So what would it look like that we can say that, look, we can be proud that we have a strong arts and culture scene in the city? I mean, a cultural future, as the title says. I think it needs... Um collaboration between public and private, sure. um, which we've been talking about. Uh, there's a, And I think we actually have to upgrade what we think is possible, being realistic of the way in which our government works. Um, I think wishing that we would have these, you know, people with good foresight and, you know, um, ability to think for the long term is is just not possible. I mean, the whole political system is set it's up. Wishful thinking too. It's set up that way. And, you know, if you put on, if you look at it in a, through a very cold way, I mean, they're all doing those things because that's just how the system is. And how do you actually make that change? Like, when is that actually going to change? So I, I don't know how that changes, but maybe there is a way, like the many insights in terms of how do you keep public spaces, uh, how do you protect them? Maybe there are some insights there and, and we have to figure out how that is. Um, for, for, for the institutions that we are building, like IME and MAP and, and so on, um, they're important because not just are they uh, creating spaces for people to come and enjoy and be proud of their art, but I think we all have to take thought leadership positions. Um, yes, we are creating uh, these spaces, but also what, how do we use that position of prominence to bring, um, you know, uh, world-class performers, institutions, etc., and collaborate with us here in Bangalore. So we can set that up, um, you know, um, by I guess just getting more resources and, and working with more people in the space, not just for that specific space, but trying to do that for the um, scene at large. So really collaboration, one in terms of public-private, and then among the private players who are there, how do they come together, become a collective to be able to scale this whole thing up? I think that's... Yeah, and I think once that's there, you'll start to see a lot more of the grassroots movement because they will see it as an ecosystem that is basically friendly to this. Okay. It's very difficult to be a lone voice in the wilderness, um, 
without seeing some kind of support somewhere. So, Mitra, um, I think most of the new uh, places they have they are making a larger difference, not just by physical presence. I think there's a lot of outreach programs which are uh, kind of making the effect reach a lot more people even at their locations. Like I, I've even before the map building is ready, a number of outreach programs have been going on for years. So it's and a much sense, larger. COVID has helped uh, by going digital yes, ahead of too. the physical. That too. So um, the critical thing, I mean, when I imagine the, this is a city where there's a very large number of people who have migrated here and um, diversity is very high. Um, so if one is trying to make um, a connection, it is actually across cultures, it is across time, it is across place. So here I think the narrative of, and I think Naresh did touch upon this, of uh, the idea of, of the narrative and what is the new narrative. And here uh, I, I, I have a slight grouse, I have, of course I have conserved some buildings and worked with them, but I, I do have a concern that the present is never considered as tomorrow's history. And I think we are undermining the present. Um, the value of what we are creating today uh, is as much what is good uh, today is will be actually the value uh, valuable thing uh, as seen looking backwards. So I think the narrative needs to tie up um, uh, which is related to the city and different cultures and that has to tie up not only from the past because I think nostalgia is easy. It comes naturally. But I think the, the path is beyond that. So it has to connect to the present and a future which is aspiration. So, and I think that's the spirit of, of a city like Bangalore. Maybe the future will be in the metaverse. Naresh? I hope not. <laughs> metaverse is some time to come. We still have to fix HSR layout, otherwise they'll keep tweeting. <laughs> otherwise they'll tweet on a daily basis. Today there was a, funnily enough, there was a government meeting on what to do about these people in HSR layout. <laughs> They tweet and other people pick them up and so on and so forth. It's a funny meeting anyway. <laughs> yeah, so really I think it will only happen in an organic way. People have to come together, hearts have to open, purses have to open, institutions, it's not just enough to do that either. We all know that. A lot of our... So what I would say that is that maybe just this audience to start with and maybe you can each one can bring one for the next meeting that we have is that appoint yourself a custodian of the city. We are all self-appointed custodians of the city and nobody will give you that appointment. But if you go around saying, I own this city and I won't let it fall apart and I'm going to live here forever and it has to be livable for me forever. It's not enough that I live here. The automatically the attitude and it starts in a neighborhood, then there will be a larger issue. For instance, you know, something like this started. I'll give you an example. How... Some, all of you can contribute to something like this. Three guys who run food stalls in Tindi Bidi, in Vishwasharapuram, met me somewhere and said, Sir, Church Street, Nodidivi, Namgu Ange Madkodi. Three guys. That's all. There are 90 food outlets on that one road. I Correct? So I told them, fine, you do, you get your gang together. Ila, sir, in 90 people, there are four associations. There is a Panipuri type association, there is a Masal Dosa type association, there is a ice cream. Can, can you believe the division? And just in 70 people, there are four separate groups in that whole thing. I said, this won't work. Get one guy from two guys from each group, do it. And then I said, go and talk to the politician. First of all, get sing a song to them. I'll give you material to sing a song. Do it. It Within like four months of doing this, all of them have come back to me with air cover, with politician air cover, with funding air cover, with everything possible. And they're saying, okay, execute. Give us an idea what to do now. So every single neighborhood in Bangalore must get the equivalent of a church street or a commercial street in your area, which is a public space and need not necessarily be only a commercial kind of thing. Right. It can be a park, it can be a drain, it can take one thing. And what I call this technology is called urban acupuncture. 
you know, you, all of you know what is acupuncture, right? You, you have a pain in your leg, they'll put a needle in your uh, shoulder or something, it'll magically go away. So I think that the whole city needs urban acupuncture by a different kinds of scales, different kinds of projects, different kinds of this thing. And maybe one day all these balloons of excellence will touch each other and we'll have a Bangalore that we'll be proud of. Maybe not in our lifetime, but at least our children won't curse us saying that, what did you screw up and leave behind for us? I think that's the attitude to take and maybe from on a positive note, it is possible to do it. But it requires, but the process of doing it is extraordinarily painful, extremely frustrating and it requires, as I said, people to, dealing with people with pointy stakes in their hands. Now if you can the, solve this, you can do it. Naresh the optimist. Okay, we now throw open to questions. Please come down here and ask your question from here, please. Anybody? Yeah, Raghu, you can get it started. Yeah, so uh, the question I have is since, uh, you know, this is talking about architecting Bangalore's cultural future. Uh, I think a lot of the recent initiatives have focused on uh, spaces like museums and, 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 you know, places where you can show things, right? And showcase uh, and display. But uh, I find that we're not thinking as much as a, a uh, as much about the maker spaces, you know, where is this art and where is this culture that you're talking about actually being made, you know, where are the artist studios, where are the recording studios, for instance, you know, the Bangalore music scene has been devastated by this whole sort of, you know, Indira Nag regulations and where are the new menu venues for the music, right, where is this, we're more interested in, in sort of uh, uh, having these musicians finally perform, but how are they actually uh, you know, uh, what are the circumstances and how are we enabling creating that? Because like Naresh said, you know, that people think Bangalore started with Infosys. Uh, the software industry started because there was the sort of, you know, the uh, right environment in the city to kind of uh, make this industry happen, you know. And so what are we doing now to, to create these spaces, right? Like, for instance, why do we need more museums? Uh, when the Kannada film industry has to go to Annapurna Studios to finish their films, right? Wait, this is cultural enterprise. And where are the spaces? But how can architects answer that question? This is a function of market forces, right? It's a function of social and market forces. For instance, you asked a Kannada, where do the Kannada industry go? This problem came up about 10 years ago. And I had suggested that, you know, with the, actually a double agenda, that why don't we put it on the top floor of city market? Because the metro was coming right under it. You don't have to negotiate anything. You just pop out of the metro and the city market is standing in front of you. The whole thing could become a bunch of film studios and the stealth agenda would be that politicians would come to be interviewed and the whole area will get cleaned up anyway. So, you can achieve double action by the same thing. But architects are only, architects have to be commissioned or architects at least propose ideas into the system which have to be accepted. We are not the mover and shaker. We don't pay for it. We don't have the so necessary project management skills the, to execute. The critique was, I think, of like architects in general that like, you know, when, when there is a space like, you know, that or, or even the way we think, but we look forward to architects to sort of change that. Yeah, and, and, and we try, but and, it's and, not. Uh, I'm and think maybe build some studio. So I think the uh, real water. person in control is sitting there. So <laughs> I, I was waiting for that. Exactly. Something. This is actually See, because they decide to do it. Architects will happy to support it. See, this needs somebody to pay the check. Uh, but the other thing, Raghu, really is, you know, you need an enabling system. While there are market forces which will determine recording studios and the like. The biggest thing, the 800 pound gorilla is government. I mean, government can provide an enabling framework for many of these things to happen. And that unfortunately is what we are missing in the system. Yeah, I, I, the, just to clarify that, I agree, but uh, the point I was making was that the focus is on the final output, you know, of, of an art or, or, you know, that I think the interim process is what we're missing. Not necessary, you know, Church Street is not about art. K100 is not about no, no, but you know, Manish, I think the other point he is making, for example, is government. They've been all zealous in sh shutting down restaurants which have live music. 
By that itself, you're killing a certain cultural form. But that is but an exercise problem. I don't know if that's problem. the government. That's not a music problem. Is that that's the government problem. or the neighborhood association? The neighborhood so it's actually people who are problem. doing that, right? It's it's the it's a problem of growth of any major city. Um, honestly, whether it is restaurants that have live music that have just started coming up in what used to be previously a very quiet mm -hmm. neighborhood. Listen. Typical, uh, I mean, the most common uh, problem is in Alagan, I mean, right? right? Um, all of those venues have had to be shut down. Or in, you know, some other countries, uh, the, the cities grow, or well, in our own city, HAL is now in the middle of the entire city. And, uh, you know, in certain other countries, you have the sound of airplanes flying and suddenly people are mad about it. But that's where the, that's how the city grew. It grew out towards where there were existing, you know, facilities and amenities. And now suddenly the same people who enjoy the benefits of being in that city don't like that anymore. So I think, I don't know, is that human nature? You're the optimist. Maybe I'm the realist. The I don't nature. want to say pessimist. Any other right. questions? Please right. come here. Yeah. Uh, so, sir, my question is... Uh, so my question is, how huge is the gap between place making and policy making? And how do we bridge that gap between the two? Both, both words are fairly meaningless. <laughs> and and, and they are mostly jargon. Policy is made by consensus. And that consensus is usually dominated by government. And what architects try to think that they're doing placemaking is actually not that easy at all. So to convey that idea, actually the word placemaking itself has become anachronistic. Right? It's not only about a place, it's about making it people-friendly and inclusive. I think that's a bigger agenda than just creating pretty places. So there is a giant gap, but it's possible to resolve these if you're sensitive enough to and don't lose track of your fundamental principles. See, what happens in government is like what uh, Groucho Marx once said, no? He said, I have some principles. If you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> this is how... So it's very difficult to uh, pin it down like that. So, but it's important to stick to certain themes that Ravi uh, laid out in the beginning of this talk, saying that social inclusion, social equity, making sure that there, it's a benefit, the maximum impact for the minimum investment. Also, continuity and programming and making sure that it doesn't become a capex and just falls apart one year after it's... Many places in Bangalore, that has also happened. You create something jazzy and then one year later, gone. Down the tube. So, these broad framework principles... And you keep testing the project against these principles again and again and again and again. And if it fails, bring it back up to the, again, back to the mark. If you keep doing it, I think projects will work and they will sustain. And the point that Sobitra made, these are very negotiated. Everything is negotiated. There's nothing which is cast in stone or black and white between policy making and place making. Nothing, yeah. Chandra? Uh, one more yeah. Uh, so I had a chance of designing a space for BBMP. So what had happened was with all the friction and fight, I got the fencing out. So because they were not ready to get, take out the fencing for a park. But what happened was vandalizing. Everything was gone, including a plant. They just dug out a beautiful plant and they took it. It was like BBMP were like staring at me. Like a death Like they told you so why the yeah. fence is there. Yeah. So is it a behavioral change what we have to bring in the, for the public? Or how do we tell public that these are your spaces. You have to guard them. So we don't have to put a security guard or a camera, like having someone 24 into 7 asking not to asking them not to touch it because it is public space. And how do you tell people so public not answer, touch their own things? Yeah. yeah. Actually, we were talking about this right before this panel started, and Somitra, we should also add. But basically, coming back to the earlier point, I think. If we want people to behave a certain way and change behaviors at that kind of scale, that's just truly unrealistic. I think we have to figure out what will work with our system, our mentality, our psyche. There are things we just cannot change about the way we are. Um, so maybe you want to uh, talk about how we were discussing the way places are set up um, yeah. elsewhere. So I think we were discussing about how different the present scenario of open spaces in neighborhoods is because nobody really has an eye over that space. It's impossible uh, the way, you know, it might be individual houses or apartments 
while the earlier system was that um, any space would be surrounded by residents who are constantly either at the edge of the street. So that is the most safest way of surveillance and the softest way of surveillance. Um, no manner of policing can ever solve this uh, problem. I mean, we faced the same thing in when we were doing Freedom Park. How do I make a bench which nobody can steal? So it's a huge block of stone, so nobody can do anything or is interested in doing anything to it. Well, Minimize a lot of the landscaping, right? You had said the yeah. medieval system was to just build, you know, um, just open yeah, spaces. Yes, cities were compact and uh, large areas were actually paved. And the the forest and the, and the, and the town and the city were different entities, clearly. So I think Naresh, you wanted to add something. I think we have to wait for economic disparity to come down. Till G that happens, GDP needs problem. to increase. That's what I'm saying. No, the government thinks you are the problem, and they're right also in this in this case. <laughs> no, one of my favorite uh, uh, sort of uh, anecdotes is that wall outside Shangri-La, which they really tried hard to make it a green wall yeah. <laughs> by putting a lot of plants in little pots, and it looked very nice. But the next day, all the plants were gone. Yeah. So you have to grow creepers because nobody is going to drag those out of the... So what is the practical way of approaching it? Well, I think the questions that you're answering right now are pertaining to civic behavior and people's morality and all those kinds of things. I just have one question which has stayed with me right from the time Samitra talked about it. Uh, when uh, Ravi asked him the question about form and function, and you answered that, uh, uh, you answered that uh, yes, there are these situations and when we are creating a space for a specific objective, many times we just do it, we'll only create an empty space and then it takes its own, uh, you know, it works according to whatever the need is. Uh, I have this question that when, especially when you're very clear about what that that space is supposed to be for, whether in a museum or in a building like this, uh, if it is for performing, then why not take on some performers on your team who actually understand the space? Because tomorrow they are the ones who are going to be using it. And uh, if it's a collaborative uh, effort, then you understand where you're, you're not expected. The architect is not expected to know uh, what the performers are going to be needing. So I think that collaborative work would yeah. help in many, many areas. Sure, like I that. totally understand that view. Any and good architect would do that. And we have actually, in case of MAP, we have obviously done it because we've had people either on the board or advisors. We even have an architectural advisor. It's well, not I wish you had said that because, you know, it was such a no, huge... No, we have, we have, a, we have a, yeah. a, a board and where there are experts from every field and um, inputs have been taken um, for all the spaces, which includes even the gallery spaces, including getting inputs for from the best in the world uh, um, performance spaces as well. The best we could do, we we have actually had people on the board. Oh, that this could and it makes perfect sense. I was very sense. surprised when you said that hmm. because I thought that you know it's so important. To yes. understand what that from space the is going users, to be used uh, for. Yes. Yeah. Even, so, the, even the space we are sitting in, we had Girish Karnad tell us I what know. to do. No, in fact, this space, I was just going to come to that. I was there with him. Girish Karnad, Arundhati Nag, MS Satyu, and subsequently Anmol, all people who understand audio. We had it wrong. Actually, this uh, stage was finishing somewhere oh, here. We extended it by seven and a half I feet know. and gave up a row based on inputs from people who obviously know better. And we had initially got it wrong, but corrected ourselves. So yes. this I process... Yes, I was there with Girish that day, actually, when it was being measured, so and we talked about it. And I also know that uh, at the IFA, when it was being started, but Mishri Bansi Kaul had very emphatically talked with Anmol Vilani and said that, you know, the, the theater people must work with the architects. Because till then, at least in the mid-90s, this kind of collaborative work was not happening and the spaces were being created with no understanding of that That's particular true. form that it was going but to be But increasingly it's happening. I think it's yeah, impossible it today it to and do I these buildings without that. 
again just going back to uh, what you said that uh, you know the f- uh, the present is supposed to connect to future and definitely in a city like bangalore where so many people have come from outside their engagement with the city starts from today from the time that they come so it's very logical to think that there it is from present that the future would come of course present will always come from the, uh, uh, the future will always come from the present however there is a past and it is very important to connect it to the past and especially in a place like bangalore where it's becoming so heterogeneous it's important to look at the real root of the city because the richness of the culture actually exists there you know nobody knows that actually the next day after ram navmi in this very space dumlur where we have bic there is a temple which is from second century and on the 10th day the whole night rat, uh, uh, jatra happens where the whole night there will be something like 45 chariots all decked up with flowers beautifully done and by the morning it's all gone how many people go there how many people who can actually experience that absolutely amazing scenario don't even know they're all sleeping in their homes <laughs> so it's very important you know yes uh, present is important but i think past is extremely important Point and taken. if we have come to the city yeah. it's important for us to connect to that past and then take it forward and the living cultures you know i mean exactly the, uh, like calcutta you're from calcutta if calcutta has retained its authenticity and its uh, depth of culture it is because whoever goes to calcutta actually becomes part of that it's not the other way around so here we have the diversity and the richness of it but i think at the bottom of it it would be interesting to think about it that how we can carry that the very root of it and the richness which really exists in bangalore Thank thanks thanks hi i have uh, two questions or rather some yes okay speak speak okay you yeah, have two questions and uh, probably there are uh, points i would like to discuss uh, i am somebody who's been in bangalore since a year and a little more than that and uh, so what i feel that the city needs especially since it's the city of say it hub there are people working at odd hours uh, why do we not discuss or uh, why do we not have a public space which is which can hold a huge mass like i am saying this with by drawing parallels to bombay and marine drive in bombay uh, that it is one space where you can go to and there is most half more than half the city is there and we are all there free of cost doing whatever we want talking about whatever we want uh, azad maidan or siraji yeah. park but they are yet they are closed after a certain point parks get closed but <laughs> bombay adva- like it enjoys the luxury of the sea a uh, waterfront and the sea edge which bangalore doesn't have but bangalore has that that kind of population and that kind of people who needs a public space all throughout there are people who finish work late at night and be- can we e- what is the p- and to me kaban park is a parallel uh, what marine drive is to bombay is kaban park is to bangalore that's that's the environment and the vibe you get with the kind of there's a something that you feel when there are that many people doing whatever they want to and you're part of it even if you're alone it doesn't matter so uh, that what is the possibility of that in the city when the city the growth rate of the city and the kind of people the city has tends to is moving towards that and all you can do is go out for dinner and few drinks after work so what is that possibility of uh, that kind of a public space because we are talking about like mr narish pointed out that you know there's the possibility of having these long walkways and people can walk and but what is the possibility of that at happening at night and being a safe space at night and that brings me to my second question which is about having spaces which is 
gender friendly how do we talk how do we have such i mean i personally don't have not seen or i don't have any ideas either that's why that uh, street lights don't help especially for women or transgender or for that matter that street lights don't help then the other way is secure uh, surveillance and cctvs and but that works on the principle of fear so what are the ideas we can do as architects when through design are there any that you know to make spaces in bangalore gender friendly also at night because night time is these days as equally important as the daytime so yeah You know, Mark Twain said, "Buy them land; they don't make them anymore." Right now, for your large kind of thing, I don't think in this current BBMP area anything exists unless uh, no, it does. It does. It does. H A L and N G F. Yeah, there was, for instance, there was a recent proposal to, which I was involved in, to convert the old factory of N G F. It's about 105 acres of land right behind that metro station, right near that, by open alley into something like what you're talking about, where it's open, easy to hang out, it's open all night. Etc. Etc. But unless the culture of the people change, I think you are ascribing too many superpowers to architects. <laughs> There has to be. It has to come from your culture. And Bombay has a very different culture to Bangalore. It's not at all the same. And it's a. It's not at all the. And from a gender friendly point of view, again, it's an again an issue of culture. It's a. Each city has a. I mean, no, Bombay is a city. Bombay is a city that stays up late and opens earlier, and that city per se is a safer city. But Bangalore is also moving towards. It's moving, but not yet got there. You know, if you um, from young people's point of view, I understand that you can party till two in the morning on, on weekends. But really, most of the city I notice goes to sleep around ten thirty, and only and in the like you know in I'll tell you when. How culturally different we are. You take something called the Madras Mail, right? The train which goes to Chennai. It lands at 5 a.m. or 4:45. It reaches Chennai. It's bedlam outside. You go outside the station. It's like the entire city is honking, screaming, <laughs> coffee, <laughs> degree, coffee, <laughs> idli, vada. It's like a like entire city is awake and working. You take the same train back and come to Bangalore. It comes at 5 o'clock. There is not even a flea stirring in the <laughs> railway station. <laughs> only people get up only around seven thirty eight. Okay, shall we like you know negotiate the day? So it's a nothing. I have I have once I came in the morning. It looks like a ghost town at five thirty in the morning. You wonder where all the people are. So culturally very different. And two, I think compared to other than the exception of Bombay, I would think because you have so many people there. It's automatically gender friendly because there is somebody watching you all the time, even if you don't like it. But compared to a North Indian city, right? And this was told to me by a friend of mine who brought her house help to live in Bangalore. And that I was talking to that lady and saying, "Kesa, how is it going?" And all that. She's saying nobody hoggles at me here. And if I go and out in a market at seven o'clock in the evening in Delhi, I get hoggled. I get. Commented upon, I get everything. Is it no? So there is a cultural difference. I think in the south we are a softer people. It's not as best as it could be. But to ascribe architects superpowers of changing gender attitudes and gender stereotypes, I think is a bit much. Now, last but question. But we can try. Nina. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we are really out of time. Last question, and let's. Uh... Yeah. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that you know you've started a really good trend. Um, you know, with Church Street and and the stormwater drains, and it's it's perfect. Uh, and I hope that will sort of continue, and it'll have that ripple effect. Um, my question to you is a little more um, uh, you know open in the sense that we are looking at at various aspects of the city, but. the neighborhood parks something that's close to you that also needs to get rejuvenated and and how does something like that happen because then it takes the pressure off all these large open spaces uh and the other question since you working so much with the city is we have such a large area in the city right in the heart of the city which has gone to the military and to the armed forces is that whole parade ground and that whole area i mean they can relocate anywhere else i mean is that something that can happen because there is such a large lung of the city which is given to that they can even just open it to us that itself will help <laughs> i mean 
that could be just like the Azad Maidan, or it could be the Maidan that is in in Bombay, and and that could just you know what, suffice in what she was talking about. Anyway, you are asking that question to the most influential person in the room, Navesh. That's not true. <laughs> We have made in many attempts in the past to talk to the military by starting to tell them give us BRV theatre as a public space, and at one point we even convinced the uh, military to make part of parade ground into a park. They actually did it. There is a giant park. No, no, no. It is not small. It's almost about 25 acres of one corner of the parade ground. Traffic. And they promptly locked it up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's actually, a, when you go in the metro, you can see it. It goes through that park. It's about 25 acres of land. The army, just like you and me, considers this land as a real, as a real estate, which has got FSI and therefore got a value. So when the when we were negotiating this drain problem, a new road needed to be laid from Ejipura along the stormwater drain edge all the way connecting back to uh, Agara. I don't know whether you are familiar with those areas. These are the distant suburbs of Bangalore, which are now actually become the center of the city. But many old Bangaloreans don't even understand the geography of those areas. So, and the army had to surrender. Four acres of agaram ground to create that road, just four acres. That's all. In return, the army wanted forty acres outside Bangalore as compensation. So the government said, "This is crazy." But in terms of real estate value, that's what it is. Four acres of land in Kormangla is worth forty acres in Kanakpura or something like that. They, so the, the, where is the land to give it to them? And two, they want it in a strategic place. They have their own logic why they have to be in the middle of the city, etc., etc. So that's not a. We might achieve these minor victories, but the army is not going to give up. And in in a look at it from the flip side, from what the maintenance issues and looking after issues that the one thing the army does to it land is look after it really well. You go into any army encampment, everything is perfect. You you want to take that and put it under BBMP? God save that land. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I think it's better to leave them as the original green lung of the city and figure out like what you pointed out, Ravi, last time. If our entire focus as planners and architects and self-appointed custodians of the city is to go on endlessly mucking with the existing Bangalore, which is 800 kilometers of area approximately. Ravi pointed out some time back, and we've been discussing it, saying that the Payapa, the Bangalore it's International larger. Airport Authority. Has 829 acres of land under its control. That's the new Bangalore, the, to the north of the city. Really speaking, all our energy should be going into making sure we don't do the same mistakes that has happened here. And as a collective force between real estate developers, transport planners, architects, interested citizens, policy makers, everybody who's got a stake in this, to make sure that. The new Bangalore that is going to come, and it will be upon you within the next ten years. So, it's not that far away. Is done right, and that's what will create the a new. Point I really made is Bayapa, which is larger than the current BBMP area, can be the good twin to yeah. this Bangalore, but it might yeah. end up being the evil twin. Yeah, we should <laughs> be able able to, about it. Not only are, uh, we should we should be able. To, all of us should really not end. If we do that, people will stop paying attention to this, and all the guys who are. The garbage mafia, which doesn't allow anything to happen, the drain mafia, etc. We'll all lose interest here and run there. Then we'll fix this. <laughs> Thank you. How about on that? that note, we are a little out of time. Normally, we are very particular about closing on time. Uh, thank you, everybody, for hanging in till the end of the conversation. Thank you, fellow panelists, for an interesting, scintillating conversation. Uh, thank you, and see you at the next BIC event. Thank you. Thank you.